Hello, physical science students, and welcome to section 3.6. We're going to talk about conduction, convection, and radiation. I know you've all heard these words before, and you might already even know what they are. So if that's the case, you can tell me what they all have in common. What do they all have in common? They transfer energy. Conduction, convection, and radiation are all uh, methods of transferring thermal energy. Let's take a look at each one of these individually now. Conduction transfers thermal energy. I'm going to talk about conduction first. By collisions between particles. So collisions between the little particles of matter, the little molecules, is what gives us the transfer of thermal energy via conduction. And you can think about it in this liquid here. We've got some nice hot chocolate. We've got all those little hot chocolate molecules uh, bumping around into each other with lots of kinetic energy in them and traveling about. And as they bump into each other and as they bump into this spoon, they actually transfer thermal energy because the molecules bump into the particles in the spoon. And that transfers the thermal energy from the hot chocolate liquid um, into the metal spoon. Here are more examples of that. Here's an example of conduction. Um, there are actually little particles moving about transferring um, that thermal energy from the flame into that rod. So when we talk about conduction, we also can talk about good conductors of heat. And kind of a similar word here, conduction, and what is a good conductor of heat? What does this process well where we have transfer of thermal energy by collisions between particles of matter? Well, you all know this because um, you've probably all cooked or, or done something where you're trying to heat a pan up. And what are pans made out of? Metals. <laughs> Metals are excellent conductors of heat. Silver, copper, aluminum oftentimes um, uh, are made uh, to, as cookware because they're good conductors of heat. They conduct thermal energy well. Um, good conductors of heat are ones in which the, that thermal energy transfer occurs quickly. We don't want to wait all day long for those um, for that thermal energy transfer to occur. So good conductors of heat um, cause that to happen in a timely manner. So now let's look at the second way we can transfer thermal energy, and that is via convection. And you've probably heard of convection because we have convection ovens, and you've heard of it in science. Convection is the transfer of thermal energy in a what we call a fluid. I'm going to explain that in a minute by movements of the warmer and cooler fluid. In this case, fluid, quote unquote, means a liquid or a gas. So convection would be something that would be taking place um, with liquids or gases or in environments where uh, we have something uh, fluid like this. And we're going to describe how this works the first thing you need to understand when we talk about convection is going to be density. Now if you'll rem remember, density is just the mass of a material divided by its volume. How much of it is there per volume, right? So if we have um, some material and we heat it up, if we have a liquid or a gas and we heat it up, um, that heating up process is going to decrease its density. And the reason for that is that its mass will not change, but its volume certainly can. Um, as we heat it up, um, it's going to become less dense, and that will have an effect on this um, transfer of thermal energy called convection. So here I just wrote this again for us. Density is mass per volume. If I increase the temperature of a fluid, um, its mass will remain the same, 
but the volume will certainly change as the as the temperature uh, increases. And when that when that volume, um, if the temperature increases and I increase the volume, I am decreasing the density. So increasing increase in temperature uh, has an inversely proportional relationship with the density. So we'll decrease the density. So this is important because in a fluid, when we have different temperatures in our fluid, we will also therefore have different densities within that fluid. And this is what drives convection. So how does convection work? Let's look at an example with our little lava lamp right here. Um, in our lava lamp, we have the lamp down here war uh, heating, producing heat, and it heats the red substance. We have two different substances here that do not mix. When that red substance is heated, and heat is transferred into it, increase in temperature, its density decreases. Therefore, it rises to the top of this fluid, where it eventually then transfers some of its thermal energy into the surrounding area, therefore cooling off. Its density increases again, and it begins to sink to the bottom, where the lamp, the process starts all over again. The lamp heats it up, uh, raises its temperature, decreases its density. It goes to the top, transfers its thermal energy back into its surroundings, um, where its density then will increase and it sinks to the bottom and the cycle goes on and on. Convection currents. This is a convection current, this cycle. They transfer thermal energy from warmer to cooler parts of a fluid. So remember, thermal energy is always transferred from warmer to cooler, never the reverse. And that same is true in con during con the process of convection and when convection currents are happening. It is important to note that in a convection current, both conduction and convection transfer thermal energy because we certainly do have particles bumping into each other in these convection currents as well. So I'd like you right now to take a moment, pause the video, and apply this idea to these two situations. Here, where we have a heater, um, a, a space heater for a room. Here, um, a little bit of geology. Remember um, convection currents within uh, the Earth's mantle. See if you can describe those based on your understanding now of convection, temperature, and density. Okay, let's take a look at the third way that thermal energy can be transferred, and that is via radiation. Radiation is the transfer of energy by electromagnetic waves. <clears throat> what are electromagnetic waves? Here are some examples of electromagnetic waves. All of these waves transfer energy from one place to another by light. They all travel at the speed of light. Gamma rays, x-rays, ultraviolet rays, sunlight right here fits right into this little place. Um, all the different wavelengths of sunlight that we see, infrared light, microwaves, radio waves. Uh, this, this is just an example of uh, different kinds of waves on the electromagnetic spectrum. Sometimes um, electromagnetic waves are, are referred to as radiant energy. Um, you might hear it uh, referred to as that as well. Energy is transferred via radiation when these elect an electromagnetic wave strikes a material and that material either absorbs or reflects or transmits some of that energy. And um, different materials will um, absorb or transmit or reflect electromagnetic radiation to different degrees. So um, the amount of transfer of energy will depend largely on the material itself. An example of a material um, through which radiation passes very easily would be a gas. Typically, uh, radiation uh, is transferred very easily through um, gases, but not as easily through liquid and certainly not through solid. So the state of matter definitely also has an impact on how well um, that energy transfer can occur. 
Now that you know three different ways that thermal energy can be transferred, we're going to look at ways um, that heat can be controlled and heat transfers can be controlled. You do this all the time. When it's cold outside, you put, um, put on a sweater or a coat um, to keep that thermal energy um, from being transferred from your body to the environment. Or if you pull out a batch of cookies from the oven, you put a hot mint on so that the thermal energy is not transferred into your hand from the pan. Animals um, all over do the same thing. Organisms um, in the world as well. Here are some examples of animals who uh, have different adaptations um, that help them to control heat. We have our... Um, our seal here, who has a very thick blubbery coat that helps um, keep the seals from transferring all that thermal energy to their environment. They can keep it inside their body. Here, the, the, the shiny scales of this lizard help it to do the opposite. The scales uh, reflect the sun's rays and help keep um, this organism from becoming too hot. Uh, here's a, just a picture of a little penguin who has um, black feathers on its back um, that actually help to keep it warm because they absorb more radiant energy for that little organism. So when we talk about controlling heat, uh, we definitely need to know the difference between thermal insulators and thermal conductors. And we've already discussed thermal conductors, material through which thermal energy moves rapidly, like metals. Metals happen to be very poor insulators. What's an insulator? Well, an insulator is a poor conductor. <laughs> They're opposites. An insulator is a material through which thermal energy moves slowly. So um, air is a very good insulator. It does not conduct heat well at all. Neither does wood. Neither does fiberglass. Uh, materials um, that are good insulators are used um, so that heat is not transferred from one place to another. Um, the actual fibers in a, in a jacket, um, like a fleece jacket, actually trap the air and hold that next to you. And air is a good insulator. It is not a good conductor. So thermal energy moves very slowly. It is not transferred quickly. And that's why this is a very good insulator. Um, insulators are used to, um, obviously, to insulate buildings to keep that thermal energy exchange from happening, or at least from happening quickly. Here is an illustration showing how a well-insulated building um, will help to control heat. In the summertime, when there is a lot of thermal energy here on the outside of the building, this insulation prevents that thermal energy exchange, so it, it allows the building to remain cooler. In the winter, when heat is being generated um, inside and you would rather not warm the entire environment with all of your uh, precious heat in there, uh, a well-insulated building will prevent that thermal energy transfer from taking place really quickly and uh, will keep the inside of the building a little bit warmer. Thermoses use these ideas for controlling heat, and a thermos uses the idea of an airspace in it to uh, help keep that thermal energy exchange um, from happening quickly. Air, remember, is an excellent insulator. It does not conduct heat well. And so um, this airspace within a thermos um, is what actually insulates um, that thermos and prevents those thermal energy exchanges from happening, or at least from happening quickly. Quick review. Make sure you know what conduction is, convection, radiation, how those work, all the vocabulary associated with that. Um, how do we see animals controlling heat? How do insulators control heat? What are conductors? How are they different from insulators? How do insulated buildings and thermoses control heat? Here's some really interesting advanced ideas. Or maybe you have your own questions that you'd like to ask and explore and research. So bring those in for some advanced proficiency, and I look forward to seeing you in class.